as well. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. And it's true that I have uh, at several occasions already have uh, had the privilege to uh, visit Trumse and your, uh, some of your uh, colleagues actually are very familiar and I also know other people in Norway and I know that Norway is a fascinating, especially for a Swiss and a Swiss German, a, a particularly fascinating um, environment to do uh, well, linguistics, uh, applied linguistics, multilingualism studies. So I've just posted a link to the handout in the chat so that you can download a PDF with references. You don't need that handout. If you feel overwhelmed and if you feel that I'm, this doesn't make any sense and there's too much information on my slides, uh, you can download it uh, and you have, get all the references and, uh, and the figures. So this is just for your personal comfort. All right. Yes, so I will uh, talk about um, predispositions for language learning, um, AKA language learning aptitude, but I will talk about it in a, in a relatively broad sense. So my talk, um, well, the main goal of this talk is of course to advertise the research project that we just finished and uh, on which we are in the process of uh, publishing a book, but uh, probably the more interesting part of my talk, as very often, is um, the history of the of the interest in language, in testing language learning at aptitude. At least I find it the more I dive into um, the historical dimension of what we're actually doing in multilingualism, the more I find it um, fascinating. And also the less I am impressed by our own originality and so many things that we think are terribly new and exciting are actually not so new. Anyway, so of course predisposition, predispositions for language learning are have a, um, an obvious policy reverence, uh, relevance. Sorry. Um, so this is a, a newspaper clipping from the UK and of course everybody, especially in multilingual countries, we like to make fun of monolingual places so apparently in the UK, um, uh, pediatricians or general practitioners are asked to um, um, uh, sign off children from foreign language teaching because it's so stressful. And a reader's comment on a, a, a newspaper paper article on a, a study on bilingualism uh, reads as follows. Of course, it's nice to have a second language, but I don't believe this science twaddle, twaddle, I don't know how you pronounce this for a second, uh, the human brain can only contain a finite amount, amount of information. And as English speakers, we are fortunate not to need a secondary language. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> as a non-English speaker, you're uh, definitely um, often um, uh, obliged to learn other languages. So underlying these ideas about multilingualism and language learning is, of course, the question, okay, so what, what, you know, what makes us apt to learn several languages? Does everybody have the same ability or uh, the same predispositions? And that is what my talk is all about. I know, and I've uh, emailed some of the people uh, who are listening now uh, about this, because I'm always interested in how these issues then, you know, uh, somehow express themselves in, in uh, local policy discourses. And Oerstein has me has told me that yes, there is actually also the worry that um, certain children may be overwhelmed in Norway. It is obviously related to the, the, uh, these two written languages that are generally taught at school. And uh, Un also pointed out a very interesting article that she co-authored with Liz Lanza about learning Norwegian as, a, uh, as an immigrant. And so, the, so I know now that there is a similar debate going on in Norway, at least to some extent, some people are worried that children, certain children may be overwhelmed by having to learn too many languages. Now in Switzerland, this debate is probably even bigger because as you probably know, Switzerland is officially quadrilingual, but of course there's a lot more languages we have the second highest immigration rate in Europe after Luxembourg. So schools, especially in urban areas are, are extremely diverse. So a typical German language primary school curriculum looks as follows. 
I'm going to talk about German speaking Switzerland, so, um, so I will focus on that. So the L1 of the locals is an Alemannic dialect that, as some of you may know, uh, can be actually, linguistically speaking, very far away from the German standard language. Uh, and then so the language of instruction would be the standard, um, which is by many people considered a foreign language, emotionally. Um, then the first foreign language starts at grade three. It can be English or French, depending on the area. The second grade five. So we're already at four languages if we count uh, uh, Swiss German as a language. And I know that um, probably uh, some of you sympathize that actually dialects uh, from a psycholinguistic perspective uh, can absolutely count as a language. And I completely agree with that. And then of course, we have a lot of what we call allophones, children with other uh, languages, background languages. So we're, we easily arrive at five, six, seven languages in the repertoire. Okay, so it is not completely um, unheard of that, or it's not completely absurd to ask the question whether certain children might be overwhelmed by the language curriculum. I don't think this is a priori uh, a stupid question to ask. So this is one reason why one, one might be interested in um, uh, investigating predispositions to learn additional languages. And the most, let's say, historically speaking, the, the impetus for developing uh, language aptitude tests was prognostication. Uh, and I will, I will come back to that. Um, so basically, especially in the first decades of the 20th century in the US, for actually for economic reasons, for educational economic reasons, people wanted to be able to prognosticate the success in foreign language learning um, in individuals. That's one interest. Um, another um, goal, of course, as linguists, we're interested as acquisitionists, we want to develop th theory. So testing different components of predispositions for learning um, languages uh, will teach us, learn us something um, about um, you know, wh what it means to learn a language and maybe also what it means to master a language and to use a language. Um, in SLA, second language studies, uh, aptitude is sometimes used as a covariate. So for instance, if, if you're familiar with uh, the Robert de Kaiser studies that are, um, uh, I mean, his interest is actually um, uh, testing the fundamental difference hypothesis with respect to age. So it's a, it's a generativist acquisitional model that he wants to put to the test. And he just co controls for language learning aptitude um, um, uh, in his studies where he varies the age of onset. Um, so, so he's not interested in aptitude, but he needs aptitude as a covariate. Then there is um, the idea, um, it is an idea that is related to learner styles um, or learning styles that, um, you know, certain people learn languages in a certain way, there's different types of learners, and then you, if you teach the languages um, uh, in a way that matches the individual learner style, um, they uh, will be more efficient. They, I'm only aware of one um, empirical study uh, by Wishy from the Canadian context, as you can see, it's quite old. Um, uh, and the whole idea of learner styles is highly controversial in psychology, as you probably know. So, but the, the idea is still out there. And then more recently, people became interested in uh, the question to what extent actually these predispositions uh, may or may not be um, heritable. So genetically, uh, genetically um, fixed. And I will come back to that in the discussion section. All right, um, so these early aptitude tests um, um, were very much basically were developed in the wake of the interest in uh, other cognitive uh, testing. So the, this is the time when uh, intelligence testing was developed. And so one of the questions that people had was whether intelligence explains everything or whether there is a need for additional uh, subject specific tests to prognosticate uh, learner development. And uh, when high school education was generalized, which is where actually foreign language teaching happened in the US. Um, uh, so these foreign languages were introduced as subjects in high school. 
but only very few weekly lessons, which is also something that we are actually quite familiar with in, in, in the language policy discourse. And so there was just, you, teachers realized that actually very often the, the learning outcomes, I mean, it was just basically people didn't learn anything. Um, so uh, this is actually a sister, sister Michelle, um, uh, who worked in Michigan, was a German teacher, if I remember correctly, um, writes about the deplorable mortality in foreign language classes. So, I mean, mortality in the sense of, the, you know, people didn't die, but they didn't learn anything. And so aptitude tests were developed uh, from the 1920s on. Um, and uh, sister Michelle actually herself developed quite an interesting battery of aptitude tests where she taught an artificial, I think it was Esperanto in, in, in many lessons. And she would also test the ability to infer cognate words in the target language, so words that are somehow familiar to words already acquired, um, which of course, as some of you may know, is one of the things we investigated and have actually had the privilege to talk about our cognate studies in Trumse years ago. So <clears throat> it's funny that this actually appears here as one component of modern language learning to, uh, aptitude tests. All right, so the questions asked um, in this period were actually very similar to the questions that we are still asking today. So is it is language learning somehow, can it be explained by just general cognitive ability, general learning ability, or is there something specific about it? Should we ex um, include motivational, teacher-related factors or not? Um, should the target language be part of the aptitude test or not? And I will come to that. Uh, that's actually a, 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 an extremely relevant question. Um, should um, uh, So to what extent is it possible to make an ac accurate uh, um, prediction of development across time? Are there thresholds? So is there just a minimal threshold that needs to be uh, um, attained and from then on everybody is more or less the same. So these are all questions that we're actually, we actually know from current day uh, applied linguistics uh, discussions and also psycholinguistic discussions. All right, so as you can see, aptitude from the onset was considered a multi-component construct. So you have proficiency in the target language, yes or no. I mean, some people included it, others didn't. Uh, things like IQ, memory, other cognitive factors, effective factors like anxiety, motivation, or external encourage, encouragement by parents, by teachers, and so forth. Okay, so as I said, the main goal was to prognosticate development in the target language, in one, occasionally also several target languages. This became very important during and after uh, the Second World War. Um, these early tests actually proved to be not very good, so very low prognostic value. Um, but it was increasingly important to be able, in the US, to be able to recruit rapid learners for intelligence and military purposes. And this is why actually the whole I would say, research complex on modern language learning aptitude in the US is still highly um, and closely related to military and intelligence um, uh, money. So this is also the reason why you don't get, for instance, um, precise uh, information about modern developments like the high lab, or high aptitude tests, because they are funded by the military and uh, you, don't, you don't get access to the, the data and, and, and the test items. So they, there's, there's an intelligence component to it. So in, there was a, a um, military training school in Monterey in, in California that taught after the war um, relevant foreign languages. And for instance, the failure rates with these traditional tests was, were extremely high. So despite this uh, previous screening, still 80% of the learners of Japanese, for instance, just failed and didn't learn uh, sufficient, um, uh, didn't attain sufficient uh, uh, skills in the target language. All right, that's when uh, the test was developed that you may know because it is still a classic test, let's say, by developed by Carolyn Sapon in the 50s um, in Harvard. Uh, the idea was again to reduce the mortality in these foreign language classes, again in the military uh, context. 
and uh, the test or the, 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 the piloting studies for the test were done with learners of the Air Force. And Carol and Sapong did what we would still do and what we also did. As I will show you today, they ran different tests and then did factor analysis to, to discover the different components of this ability. And this is where the MLOTS, the Modern Language Aptitude Test, was developed. A test that is still out there. Uh, it's kind of difficult to buy, um, uh, but uh, but it is still used. And this is also the test that was that inspired other tests that you might have used yourselves already, like the Lama test, Palmyra and Swansea, who developed uh, an, an online or an electronic version that is clearly based on the MLOT test. Okay, so what does the MLOT test um, actually investigate, or what does it test? What what are the metrics? The first component in Carol and Sappen's approach is the phonet ph phonetic coding ability. So perceive and remember sounds of languages and associate them with symbols. Grammatical sensitivity in a language that is already learned. Um, rote learning, just, you know, straightforward forward, uh, associate, associative learning. And induction, uh, the ability to infer or induce rules. It is interesting that this fourth point that I actually consider really important in, uh, in multilingual language learning did not make it into the MLOT test. It is in the theory, but it's, there is no test component that is actually in the test, as you can see here. This is the, the, the different components of the MLOT test. We don't need to go through them in detail. Um, there's a number learning task. There's a phonetic script task, spelling clues, words in sentences, and a pair associate like a rote learning task. And again, we don't need to understand all these modules. Maybe you've already worked with the test, that's possible. Let's just look at one uh, module, the words and sentences. So this is a test that is supposed to measure grammatical sens sensitivity. So you, it's a test that is actually done without any grammatical meta language. You just get examples and then new items, examples where specific we would say constituents or, or, or um, phrases, noun phrases or word phrases are, are uh, highlighted. And then you get new items and you need to find the, the corresponding constituents. We adapted this um, task and we translated it. We got the permission um, from the test developers. And so we de developed a German language version um, that we used in, our, in the research project that I will present to you. Um, so you can see here, you get examples here, and then um, uh, where you have one, uh, one item, in this case, it's the finite verb, is highlighted, and then in, uh, the, um, in the test items, you need to identify the element in the clause that has, fulfills the same grammatical function. Okay, and then the more uh, items, so you do this on the time constraint, and the more items you do correctly, the higher your score. We also uh, adapted a second test that is somehow related to the ideas of the MLOT. It's called the P Lab. You find the reference on the handout. This is an inductive learning task where you actually um, have to learn a, um, a new unknown language. You're given a list of words and uh, morphemes and their translation. And then you get new items in the language that of uh, in your language or the language of education. And you have to identify um, the correct translation in this new language based on the information that you got up here. So this is just to give you some examples of how these language related abilities can be tested. Now. Let's go back to the history of the, of, the, uh, of the testing, of the aptitude testing. There came the natural approach, highly influenced by Chomsky and generativist thinking about uh, language acquisition versus learning. So acquisition being you know, what, is, what happens naturally based on a lot of input versus learning, school learning. And people like Krashen, for instance, argued that these, this whole aptitude business is completely irrelevant as soon as you start teaching languages the natural way. So as soon as you appeal to the language acquisition device, which does all these miraculous things automatically, 
um, actually all these 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 metrics uh, don't play any role anymore because everybody has the language acquisition device. Everybody's equipped, so everybody can do it. You just need sufficient and good quality input. Well, um, as we now know, and actually our project confirms this, basically language teaching paradigms change across time. So this was the natural approach, then came task-based, then came multilingual language teaching, like in the Swiss context, but the linear associations of MLOT type measures and uh, learning outcomes remains always more or less the same. And that's also what Skien already pointed out in 2002. Um, um, aptitude was no, uh, no longer seen to be relevant, but actually, as Skien writes in his article, when people started looking at the, at the associations again, they were just, they were still the same. So actually, it doesn't really make a, a lot of difference. Okay. So um, we uh, have uh, uh, these cognitive language related uh, constructs that somehow are related to aptitude. We have the effective. And of course we have other things and I've already mentioned it. Some people are convinced that actually much more than what, especially sociolinguists, and I used to be a sociolinguist, uh, um, what sociolinguists would actually uh, assume um, a lot more is actually genetically uh, pre um, um, predisposed, but there's obviously also other factors, you know, and as sociolinguists, we know that uh, family background, uh, parents' education, uh, school environment, um, literacy practices at home, all these things may play a role, okay? So let me show you now some modern takes on testing modern language learning aptitude. This is actually a seminar paper from one of our students. And I just enjoyed this paper so much that I would like to share it with you. So Christopher uh, Huguenin, he wrote a very nice paper where he basically recorded uh, Albanian, which is a very common immigrant language in Switzerland, um, but spoken by a native speaker of, um, I think, Kosovo Albanian, one of the Kosovo Albanian dialects. And he had people who don't speak any Albanian whatsoever imitate it. It's just, you know, listen to this uh, uh, sentence and imitate it. And now let me play it uh, to you. Okay, that's the model. First imitation. Not bad. And I think you will all agree that the second guy, he was not as good as the first imitation. So Christopher had these, uh, had these imitations rated by native speakers of Albanian. And then, you know, put them into relation with individual difference variables, for instance, just with the number of languages spoken by the people. And uh, what we found, what he found is that, yes, there is a, uh, the more languages people speak, the better they are at this task. And now we have to be extremely careful here. This is, there is no possibility for us to establish a causal link between the number of languages and this imitation scale, all we can say is that they are positively associated because we don't know whether people became so multilingual because they just love languages uh, and are gifted at learning languages or, be, or because the, they had to become multilinguals. And of course that makes a big difference when you try to explain causal links. So the, these imitation studies are actually, I mean, Christopher is not the only one to um, uh, to do this, and there's a very nice study by uh, my colleagues Susanne Reiter and Markus Christina from uh, Vienna, and they actually developed a, a, an imitation task with many different languages, and they tested musicians and they found out that singers, um, uh, vocalists were extremely good at imitation, whereas other musicians were not as good as, as, as uh, singers. All right, so Cognates, again, I've already told you that we've worked quite extensively on cognate guessing in related but unknown languages. And uh, what we found was we also tried to find out, so what are the predictors? Well, who is good at figuring out 
Danish, Swedish, Norwegian words, speakers of German who don't generally speak those languages. And we uh, found that the crystallized intelligence was the most robust predictor and also skills in related languages. So uh, the better they were uh, in English, the better they were also in guessing Swedish words. And in at least in the oral uh, modality, also fluid intelligence, but only in the oral modality, not in the written modality. Okay, so this cognate guessing, and remember that Sister Mary Virgil already uh, fabricated a um, uh, aptitude test that involved cognate guessing. And this cognate guessing is actually a very important part of modern day uh, multilingual teaching methods. So there is this idea that multilingual teaching is more efficient because it can, uh, it can basically foster positive transfer across languages here, across um, uh, English and French, but also, um, you know, there's also cognate words, of course, between uh, French and German or uh, German and English. Okay, so um, the, so there are actually quite high expectations on this specific skill. Um, it's another, there's another, uh, uh, that would be another talk whether these expectations are actually, um, are actually met in reality. Uh, unfortunately, very often not. Um, uh, what I want to talk about here is the last component of these underlying uh, abilities or the last factor that, or the last in terms of maybe historically speaking, um, the, this, this idea of innate differences. My colleague Narli Golestani uh, from Geneva, uh, soon also Vienna, she uh, did, um, she's a neuroscientist and she did uh, studies with phoneticians and, uh, and translators, interpreters, sorry. And what she found is actually that some parts of the brains of these um, people were anatomically different compared to so you know normal uh, people or to average people let's say and uh, and at least in part these anatomical um, differences cannot be explained by experience because they um, because the onset uh, of their development is in is already in utero so it can't be an effect of exposure it has to be something that is already genetically um, predisposed. And twin studies, this is a twin study from the UK. There are other twin studies from, for instance, the Texas twin uh, project. Uh, they don't focus uh, specifically on foreign language learning, whereas this one does. Um, but all these studies actually seem to suggest that the additive genetic component in things like mathematics skills, um, school language learning, reading, but also foreign language learning account for around 50% of the variance. So the, this is not to say that the shared and the non-shared environmental component don't play a role, but they are actually compared to the genetic influence, they, are, um, they explain a smaller part of um, the variability. So this is what you see in red. In red is what, what uh, geneticists, geneticists call A. Um, this um, additive genetic component. And as you can see, these are the GCSE scores um, in general for second language. And more than 50% of these scores are explained by, um, additive by the additive genetic component. Don't ask me uh, when you break it down into the different languages why German seems to be less genetically uh, predisposed than other languages. I don't think the authors have an explanation, so neither do I. I find this I find this potentially upsetting and quite challenging, but really interesting. So this is not to say, again, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying there's no social influence, but there's clearly also a genetic influence and we might actually underestimate it. Okay, so now I would like to talk about our project a little bit. This is a project that was funded by the, the Swiss National Center of Competence in Multilingualism. And it is joint work, so this is not just my work, this is a whole group of people here who have worked on this over about four years. And in this project, we tried to operationalize aptitude in a very broad sense. Remember that it was from very early on, there was this debate on whether, for instance, motivation, effective things should be included or not. And we clearly went for the uh, inclusive perspective on predispositions. Okay, so the first sample I would like to talk about is what we call the LAPS-1 sample. 
Um, in the German-speaking part of the canton where I live and work, Fribourg, it's a bilingual canton with a German-speaking and a French-speaking part. This is the German-speaking part. And uh, so uh, they, these uh, kids are fourth and fifth graders uh, between 10 and 12 age, uh, um, years old. Their first um, foreign language is French. So when I will be talking about regression analysis, the, the, the dependent variable will be French skills. That's the first foreign language taught because this is very close to the French um, language border. So the French as a first foreign language makes sense. So this is not, I'm not, not gonna discuss this table with you. This is just to show you the test battery in the LAPS one and then in the second, the LAPS two project. Um, it's mainly the same tests in both projects. The first one was actually a, some kind of pilot, like an extensive big pilot for the second one. Uh, we did some minor changes, but most the logic was the same and most of the tasks remained the same. So we tested, these things that I've just explained to you, these MLOT and PLAB type tests, linguistic language related abilities, psychological, uh, general psychological um, abilities, memory related, visual memory, verbal memory, uh, intelligence, creativity, then um, effective uh, things, motivational constructs, anxiety, locus of control, uh, all things that other studies have used uh, in the past. And of course, we ask questions about the background, um, family, economic um, background, but also educational background. And we tested this, the language of instruction, German. We, we tested, we did a, took a standardized German reading measure, and we tested the foreign language, uh, French and English with um, dedicated tests. All right. So LAPS one, the first study with these, the smaller sample, um, the first thing we did was that we did all these tests and then we ran a factor analysis. Basically, I, I don't know how experienced you are with these, with these techniques, but in a nutshell, factor analysis actually funnily was developed in the context of the development of intelligence testing. And the, the main interest is to reduce, if you have lots of tests like we have here. You have, I don't know, a matrix of 200 correlation coefficients. What you want to do, because you, can't, you cannot interpret this. Yeah? There's no way, it's, it's useless to see, oh, is this significant, is this not significant? It's impossible to interpret it. What you wanna do is you wanna reduce the dimensions to a handful, ideally one, two, maximum of three dimensions that somehow Mm, uh, that somehow represent dimensions that make sense to the scholar. So you, there's different techniques, and uh, but basically the, the goal is to reduce the number of dimensions that you have in your data based on correlation coefficients. So what we found in our study was that there's a first factor we call cognition. And this first factor actually, and this was kind of a surprise, and it is certainly a, a surprise if you have a very strong um, generativist background, like modular, modular thinking about language, like language being something that is to some extent independent of general cognition. Um, uh, so we did not find any difference between the language related aptitude tests and the general cognitive tests. All of this loads onto the first factor. So this is the first factor we call it cognition, but it also involves the language related tests. The second factor, um, is motivation, but mostly extrinsic. It's basically whether somebody is highly motivated because the teacher is so funny or so interesting or because the parents want me to learn French because French is important for my life or I want to learn French because I want to go over to the Francophone parts uh, of the country and work there. So I am extrinsically motivated to learn the language, that kind of thing. And the third factor, is what we call L2 academic emotion. It involves intrinsic enjoyment. I just enjoy learning French. I just find French a beautiful language. And I am I, I'm not anxious. You know, I don't, I'm not anxious to express myself or to do the exercises. Um, and my L2 concept as a learner is a positive one. So I'm a good learner of French, okay? So that would be the third factor. So these three factors explain the variability in our sample uh, quite well. So, of course, factor analysis is a tricky thing. If you only have one sample, 
there's always the danger that, yes, this is very neat and very nice, and you can nicely explain it for your sample. And as soon as someone else collects a different sample, different learners, maybe even in the same context, but just different people, none of it is replicated. And that's very common. That is why most people don't do uh, confirmatory factor analysis, only exploratory factor analysis. We decided to take the risk and we did a confirmatory factor analysis. So we collected a lot more data in a different canton in Zurich, um, different foreign language taught as the first language, English, not French, same age, but a larger sample. And one of the things I did uh, was I fitted again this factor structure that I found in the first sample to see whether this is also a good fit for these completely new data with a different foreign language. And it turned out, yes, this factor structure is also valid for this completely different uh, sample. Um, uh, as I said, there are some minor changes in the test battery, but nothing major. Uh, and the three factor structure is also a good explanation for what is going on in this second sample. All right. If we look at, the, at these factors, the three factors and the skills, um, this is just bivariate plots, so not modeled plots, but just bivariate plots. So what we see is that this cognition, the first factor, cognitive uh, aptitude factor, is highly and uh, clearly highly significantly associated with, this is now the English scores, but it will be the same with the French scores and the free data. data. The second uh, significant factor is the L2 academic emotion factor is also highly significantly associated, but the extrinsic factor actually isn't. Actually, statistically speaking for the second sample, it is even negatively associated if we control for this and for this. So it seems that it is mostly cognition and intrinsic enjoyment that matters and not so much this extrinsic uh, component. So to sum up this first part of the, of the project, um, there's no evidence for uh, at this age, maybe this is an age thing, something we can discuss, uh, for a separation of general cognitive abilities and specific linguistic abilities. We see that there is need for two motivational factors. It's not just one construct motivation, intrinsic enjoyment versus external influ influences. It is unclear to me, um, if I'm honest, uh, what that actually means for language teaching, because I'm not sure to what extent, for instance, pedagogy can really have an impact on this intrinsic enjoyment factor. It's probably easier for pedagogy to influence the extrinsic um, uh, motivation, which turns out not to be so crucial. So I don't know whether this is actually good or bad news for teaching, maybe also something we can talk about. There are positive associations with the language skills, in particular, the first and the third factor uh, factors are associated, but not extrinsic motivations, not positively associated with the skills. All right. Now, let's. this was not prognosis testing. This is, was just understanding the components and see how they are associated with a metric for general language skill at the same point in time. So now let's look at uh, prognosis testing, which is what initially gave the impetus for the development of, the, of such tests. So we, in our project, we adopted a relatively complicated modeling strategy based on machine learning techniques uh, in which you just fit tons of different models with all the information that you have in your data and you see, just see which of these models performs best for your data. That's basically what you're trying to do. And the logic is not the same. You don't try to optimize um, explanatory aspects. You, try, you just try to optimize the prognostic value. It's not exactly the same statistical um, procedures that you use. So what we did, again, to avoid overfitting to the data, we partitioned the data in two sets, a training set and a test set, and we trained the model only on the training set. And if you're interested in this, you can, yeah, you can soon, you will be able to download the data, the scripts and, and the technical report, and you can, you can see what we did in detail. Well, let me just explain the logic of it. We first um, ran a cross-validation on the training set, which basically means you always take out one class, in our case, of school children, and you predict the behavior of that class based on all the other classes that remain in the sample. And then you come to a good model, 
basically the, at the end, you know what is a good model that explains uh, the variability in the outcome variable uh, for the test sample. And then you see how well this performs on the test set. That's basically the logic. And this is the best model that we could come up with. We call it the no costs spared model. It's a model with uh, a list of predictors, English at T1, so the, 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 the same skill tested at T1, which basically means roughly two academic years before we tested them at T3, the end of our longitudinal project. So yeah, it's a bit, a bit more than one and a half years. Um, English at T1, grade at T1 plays a role. Intrinsic motivation again, the self-concept in English, uh, the German, this is the German test, German reading test, and the two uh, uh, forms that I've shown you, the MLOT and the PLAB forms, these two tasks, they are together in a multi, uh, multivariate uh, or multivariable analysis, they explain uh, the most variance at T3, which means they have the highest prognostic value. So just to give you an idea, the mean absolute error here in the middle of this seven predictors model is around 1.9. So on the scale from zero to 20, you can predict a pupil score. If you have these seven variables at T1, you can predict it with an accuracy of about 1.9, okay? That is how good the model performs. And but what is important here to see is that if you only take the English test at T1, you're almost as good. So the uh, English at T1 is maybe, what is it, 2.1 um, mean absolute error. It's not much worse. It's worse, of course, but not much worse. So this is just to give you an idea on, on how much variability we can actually explain here. So. Um, in the last uh, part, um, five, ten minutes, I would like to look at these other um, factors that um, uh, play a role uh, in explaining this construct of aptitude uh, and then in turn also the performance um, or, or the, out the outcome variable in the target language. All right. So if we look at, because I haven't talked about the background variables at all, and they, although they were part of the machine learning thing, they didn't actually turn out to be relevant uh, in the final model. So they were discarded. But they are associations and they are interest interesting. And I think some of you, I know that some of you have a, a, a very strong interest in sociolinguistic analysis. Uh, so let's look at these social variables. So for instance, we ask the, um, um, a lot of questions about the family background, for instance, income. And this is lapse two, the second sample. So uh, the English test score at T1 is very clearly linearly associated with basically how rich the families are. Uh, it hurts our feelings, but it's just, it's just there. It's in the data. Same thing with the grammatical sensitivity score. So this is the MLOT test I've shown you. Again, very clear linear association of family income and uh, performance on that test. Let's look at other variables, for instance, whether or not these pupils speak the local language at home, German, regardless of the not so unimportant question, whether it is Swiss German or standard German, the German speakers on the English uh, uh, test perform overall uh, better than uh, the speakers who don't speak German at home. And uh, another variable we looked at, uh, born in Switzerland, yes or no, the same thing, um, for language performance better for those who are born in Switzerland. So this, for the multilingualism researchers, is actually quite a, uh, a troubling um, finding because as you may know, if you know a little bit the literature about multilingualism, you, you, may, you probably know that the mainstream view on multilingual language learning is that the more languages you speak, the better you are at learning additional languages. I have worked on that extensively. I'm not gonna elaborate on it, but this is a theory out there. And these data here seem to suggest exactly the opposite. So what is it here? Is it multilingualism, is it good or bad? And I'm coming back now to the question, are for instance, the immigrant kids overwhelmed or not? Uh, uh, with uh, this task of learning additional languages on top of Swiss German, standard German, and so forth, okay? Uh, 
Um, so when I pub when I wrote this chapter, it went into peer review, and the, the reviewers asked one of the reviewers asked me to do statistical test here, uh, um, whether this is significant or not. But no, I don't want to do that because we already know that this is not sufficient. Just focusing on two variables like this is not does not justice uh, to the complexity of the whole problem. What we need to do is uh, fit a lot a lot more uh, complicated or complex models. Um, again, structural equation models. Um, so the constructs I will use here are constructs that you already know, at least in, uh, in part. Of course, the dependent variable will be here, English, scales in English at T1. And then two, these two factors that turned out to, to be important for English in the regression analysis that I've just shown you, okay? So these constructs you already know. It's what comes out of the factor analysis as the two factors that actually seem to be positively associated with um, the English skills. In addition to that, economic predispositions of the families and cultural predispositions. Economic predispositions is income, uh, savings, um, and cultural predispositions is, if you're a fan of Bourdieu, you know what I'm talking about, cultural capital, um, parents, education, how important is you know culture uh, in their lives education culture theater reading that kind of thing okay so um so the the, the models are of course obviously a lot more complicated than just a, a little t-test comparing groups um so this, this is the structure of the model here so economic predispositions cultural predispositions this academic emotion factor and this cognition factor so as I said, the latter two are already uh, uh, very familiar by now. Okay, so what do we find when we fit this model on our data? It's probably difficult to read. I did two variants, one with nice colors. Maybe this, I don't know, this one might be better. So what? let me just talk you through it. What we actually find is that these economic but more importantly so, the cultural predispositions are very clearly associated with cognition and also to some extent with this academic emotion factor, but to, the estimates are lower, okay? This is the first finding. As you can see, there is actually, you can't see this line, there is a line, but it is so light green that you can't see it. You can see it better here, yeah? but here you can't see it. That basically means that the estimates going directly from this to this, when we control for everything else, you can forget about it, there's nothing left. And the same for this. So that actually means that if we control for these background variables and for the cognitive and the emotional variables, there is no direct path going from the background to the dependent variable or to the English skills, okay? So there's a strong association between cognition and cultural predispositions, somewhat weaker uh, between economic predispositions and cognition, even weaker of background constructs, both of them and academic emotion, but it's still there. Um, so actually based on sociolinguistic and especially sociological thinking, we would expect these associations here from the background to this emotional variable to be a lot higher because that's basically what the whole habitus theory means. I mean, of course, this is a very simple way of putting it, but it means that basically at home you learn to a certain way of being, you learn culture in a certain way that then predisposes you better or worse for school. And so we expect these things actually to be much stronger than they are in reality, um, at least in our data. So if the associations between this background, uh, uh, these background variables and cognition and effective uh, constructs are controlled for, there's not much left here, okay? Very weak path. So now let's look at two specific effects, uh, effects to finish uh, the analysis. So what can we actually say now I'm really coming back to this idea that especially foreigners, migrant children are overwhelmed by learning an additional language because they have to learn all these other languages anyway. So does it matter whether you speak German at home? The descriptive plot suggested yes. Now let's have a look at whether this is actually the case. So that's why I singled out here a simple variable. Do you speak German at home as one of the languages? Yes or no. And again, if we control for the whole shebang here, 
nothing is left. Minus 0 0.05 is nothing, okay? Um, so speaking German at home has absolutely no impact if we control for everything else. Um, and the second variable I looked at was a pupil born in Switzerland, yes or no? And exactly the same, the estimate here is actually converges to zero. So it just doesn't matter, again, if we control for everything else. So the answer to the multilingualism question is, it simply doesn't matter how many languages you already speak if you control for everything else. So there is neither a positive nor a negative effect of multilingualism um, uh, if, we, if we control properly for all these variables. So to sum up my um, little talk here, it is surprising that although everybody, I mean, even if you Google MLOT tests or aptitude tests and you read the Wikipedia page, page one of the first um, comments that you find is, oh, the MLOT is considered obsolete today because it's so old. But actually, yes, it is very old and it's also very old fashioned in the way the test is designed. But actually, um, it is still, it explains a lot of variants and it is still very influential. A lot of uh, current day scholars actually refer to the MLOT and use MLOT style tests as we did um, in present day contexts. The focus of these studies is most of the time on explicit, on instructed um, second or foreign language learning, not so much on immersive context. I mean, there is some research like Robert de Keyser's uh, research, but most of the aptitude research focuses on instructed learning and not immersive or naturalistic settings. I mean, immersion can be instructed in a way, but it's a different type of instruction. Um, there is converging evidence that there's a general association of general cognition and language specific um, abilities. Other people have found that too, also with older um, uh, participants. Um, in our case, we do not find a cl clear evidence for a separation of the two. That may be different with older um, um, uh, learners. That's a, something that I would be curious to know more about. Um, we have seen that intrinsic motivation and anxiety are relevant effective constructs um, uh, and separate and, uh, and they are a separate dimension within this motivational realm. Extrinsic motivation would be the other construct, but it is only weakly associated with the skills. There is, in our data, no evidence for migrant children, for instance, being overwhelmed. We also have not uh, found any evidence for massive dispensation of foreign language, which would be something you could do. We say, oh, it's just English as a foreign language too much for this Albanian child. She needs to learn Swiss German and German first. Uh, but we did not find evi any evidence for, for this, um, which I think is interesting from an applied perspective, but also we didn't find a boost of multilingualism. Huh? So thoughts for our discussion or for discussion in general. Uh, again, the age factor, I think I would be interested in seeing whether this also, whether what we found also applies um, to older samples, adolescents or adults. Uh, I am still curious in whether there is really nothing to be found in this idea of aptitude treatment interactions of what, you know, whether people who have a very, very strong ability to, for instance, uh, learn rote learning, you know, just very, very um, strong capability of learning words quickly, whether they benefit from other teaching approaches than, than learners who are, have other, you know, strengths. Um, maybe not, but it would be, I, I'm not aware of current day studies that actually investigate this. Maybe it will be worth um, looking at. What I also find really interesting is related to this idea of um, heritability. I mean, I know that in terms of there's a very strong tradition in, in generative uh, thinking about uh, language and, and language learning or acquisition. So, and generativists, generativists make, or made at least in the past, very strong assumptions about um, heritability of the language of, of, of grammar, for instance. But of course, as an invariable uh, component of or module. Um, and of course, as you probably know, uh, there was, there's this discussion, it's even on Twitter, Martin Hospelmart has published his blog on that even generativists today actually don't believe in a lot of innate grammar anymore. So I find actually, I find it really interesting that there is, might be an interesting shift from heritability of grammar in the sense of UG, universal grammar, 
towards actually heritability of something a lot more variable, that is these predispositions. And as I've uh, shown you, some scholars actually think that this is actually a very high percentage of the variability that can be accounted for by, um, by the genes. It's not just one gene, it's a whole, it's a whole genome. Huh? So um, uh, I find this really interesting and worth exploring. It is something that we are actually trying to look at now in an ongoing project with Narli Golestani, whose work I've uh, cited before, where we're gonna do again, this is a whole battery of tests, a, a different one, but it's similar, uh, the, the basic idea is similar. But then we also look at the brains of these people in order to be able to see, okay, to tease apart, so what is what is actually probably experience-based uh, ability, and what it, what might really truly be uh, innate or inherited um, uh, inherited part of heritability. So that was it. Thanks very much, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Bertele. Uh, we have a quiet round of applause. Uh, that was fascinating. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, so do we have any questions after the... Okay, uh, yeah, Jason has a question. Oh. Okay. Now, now I can see, yeah. Okay, first of all, thank you very much. It was a really great talk and it's it's really nice to meet you. I haven't, somehow I haven't met you before, so it's really, really nice we to meet you. actually have met, but very briefly. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm really- In New York or somewhere, yeah. Okay, um, so I have a, a big question and I don't necessarily expect you to have an answer, but I, I, I just, you know, when I, when I um, hear about aptitude, kind of some hairs on my, my arms always go up for, you know, big, first of all, chicken and egg questions, right, in terms of how things are tested and, um, you know, if outcome is predicting a predisposition or if the predisposition is predicting the outcome, right? But I put that aside for a second. The question is, how comfortable do you feel with what you're capturing is an aptitude for language as opposed to an aptitude for learning? And if you care to make any type of distinction between learning and um, and acquisition, and and I mean this in the context that you've already brought up, because you you very rightfully pointed out that a, a lot of this work, the Kaiser's work, and and many people they're they're looking at this in an instructed setting and learning a language in an instructed setting, and also the way that you're measuring the outcomes of language in terms of what success is. You know, if you're looking at you know not phonology, but you're looking at morphosyntax or whatever, of course that is geared towards the expected outcome of what is correct English, so to speak, right? So is it possible that to the extent that there is something about aptitude, whether or not you show something physiological in the brain that's different, that really what you're showing is a biological predisposition for learning anything. So I wonder if in the studies that you've done, if you've looked at other things that would involve learning but are not language and see if you have a very similar effect. In other words, if somebody shows this aptitude, it's a more generalized aptitude. And in the context that we make learning of a language, learning like other things, which is the classroom context, whether we like it or not, and no matter what we do, it's not an immersive naturalistic context. Um, maybe what this is all showing is that some people have predispositions for greater learning and these correlations exist at the yeah. level of learning and we're making language fit in it. But then of course, everybody calls it linguistic aptitude, linguistic aptitude, linguistic aptitude. Yeah. So I just want your general thoughts on that, if well, that makes sense at all. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I mean, this is not, I mean, I hope that I did not commit the sin of talking about causality. I think I deliberately always talk about linear associations. And I would even say, you know, some people think that, okay, yeah, you do a longitudinal study, you can talk about causality. No, you can't. Because, it, it, you know, basically, as applied linguists, we can hardly ever talk about causality because basically in, in empirical terms, if you're really interested in, in these, you know, in the, in the logic of these uh, the, the directed acyclic graphs that I've shown you, uh, you know, about causal modeling, you, the basically in applied linguistics, 
I would say in 99% of our studies, the back door is open. It could always go from cognition to language or from language to cognition. And there's no way we control for it. There's no way also we can control for bilingualism in an experimental logic because bilingualism is just a fact of life and it takes years to become bilingual. So you can't just manipulate bilingualism as a variable as a random, randomly assigned experimental condi condition. And that is actually, I think, the original, the, 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 the origin of so many quite useless debates that we have about whether bilingualism causes cognitive advantages or not, because it's just, there's no way we can really be completely sure about the causal link. Well, that's my personal, um, that's my personal uh, uh, view and um, I'm not alone, but you are absolutely right that uh, what, what I can show with the kind of project here is associations of variables. Now, of course, the language teaching people would, say, would re respond to you, but we teach these languages in a very natural way. It's task-based, it's with authentic materials, it's with immersive islands. So they would actually claim, and some of them are deeply convinced that this is not just learning, this is really learning that at least approximates natural language acquisition. Now, I um, so your question, is a very good question. I did this project in a completely open-minded um, frame of mind, okay? So I, I, I genuinely wanted to know whether we find something language specific or not in this kind of group of learners. And we didn't, okay? Now, what that means for theory is a matter of interpretation. And again, I think, um, for the time being, the only way to really be able to make cautious uh, statements about uh, innate or not innate is indeed looking at, neuro, at the neurophysiological part and only there where we are actually sure that things are indeed uh, already somehow genetically predisposed. And we're, so this is just the beginning of something. So I complete, I, I, I think I completely agree with you. Um, I do think that um, intuitively, uh, I would say that people are just different when it comes to learning, also acquiring languages in, in second language settings. We know that some people are just faster learners than others. So I would expect that these dimensions that we identify here also explain variability in more naturalistic settings. But I cannot prove this to you, but I, I am aware of some studies out there that seem to suggest that even you know, just ge very general intelligence measures are clearly associated also with second language learning in, an, in, a, in, a, in a migration context. So in this respect, I am quite confident that what we found is not just applicable to school type of learning, but you're absolutely right that this is what we can make statements about, about associations uh, within these variables, across these variables for this specific setting, yeah. Can I just ask a quick follow-up? Do, do, do you feel comfortable committing that what you're talking about is an aptitude for language as opposed to a more general aptitude undefined that applies in this case to the task at hand, which is language? If you'll give me a second, I'll, you know, if you talk about math, for example, it all just depends on the way that we look at math. So if you, if you take um, you know, uh, a context in which people don't have formalized education as we think of it you know, across you know, this panel, we would think of it, that doesn't mean that people don't so-called acquire mathematical skills, right? You can look at you know, a tribe in, um, in you know, wherever in the Amazon, and of course they, you know, individuals will vary in terms of the really high level of sophistication that they're using math, of course, acquire naturalistically unbeknownst to them to figure out you know, the wind velocity and whatever, they completely unconscious and some wind up being better at uh, being hunters versus some other things, right? Gardner's intelligences, which is not just the one we revere in Western society. So it would be wrong, I think, intuitively to say that unless you have math class and math skills that you haven't acquired math, right? So is there, are you honing in on a predisposition that is just better at predicting naturalistic outcomes of naturalistic learning acquisition, if you will, or is, do you, do you feel comfortable saying what you're honing in on is really 
language aptitude. That's always been my real scratch the head curiosity. I don't dispute that there's going to be people that have different predispositions yeah, yeah. and that you would be able to have some evidence that correlates this to something that you can physiologically see in the brain. But but is it language? Are you willing to commit really to that, that it's it's language as opposed to whatever it is is being used in the outcome that you're choosing to, to look at, which happens to be language, because people call it language aptitude. I wonder if it's really for language, if that-, if, if that Yeah, 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 it makes perfect sense, your question. <laughs> These are things that we discussed a lot. So my, I cannot prove anything here. My expectation would be if we did, instead of testing English or French, if we did a math test, my expectation would be that the first factor would be exactly the same. So the first factor would predict that just as well. Mm -hmm. And because basically also our language aptitude modules are ways of you know in, in doing inferences and, and trying to figure out stuff, which is what you do in math. So I mm -hmm. would expect this to be exactly the same for math, the first factor, not the most motivational factor. There might be there might be differences. That's that's what I would expect. Yeah. Thank thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, nice sub discussion. So uh, we had a question from Cecile as well. I think it's a mostly a, cl a clarification question. So she asked, uh, so the apparent effect of L1 German was a manifestation of cultural capital rather than a linguistic predictor in social inequalities and what they're associated with are a key predictor. I think this question refers to the last bit that I discussed. Mm -hmm. um, so there's two L1 German is two comes in two uh, uh, shapes. I we tested uh, L1. Well, we tested German, not L1 or not. It's basically not L1 for anybody because the Swiss German, as I said, is quite far away from from the the written German. So um, uh, so we tested German and it turned out to be. Uh, loading on this first factor, just like cognition, intelligence, memory, uh, and other uh, tests. And we also then tested on top of that, um, whether speaking German at home, yes or no, made a difference. Um, and, then, and that's what the, what the person is referring to. Yes, uh, um, this, um, uh, I do consider actually sharing the local language in the family being part of the cultural capital. That is, that was my decision. Yes, and you're right. That's how I modeled it. Uh, but it's so, but it's not the only way German appears uh, in the study. But yes, uh, so German skills are an important predictor because they're part of the first factor. Uh, but speaking German at home, on top of everything else, doesn't matter. So if I if I may follow up, sorry, uh, turn on my, my video. Thank you so much for the clarification. So if I may follow up, then um, if I, if we're thinking about the effect of speaking German at home, it's a manifestation of, of a web of interrelation. It's a, you know as as a, 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 you know a manifestation of this cultural capital. So if we look at the confounds that uh, we observe in our societies. Uh, it remains a predictor. It's not a linguistic, uh, the linguistic predictor per, per se. It's it's a it's a social capital predictor, but it remains it remains there. Yes, absolutely, you're right. And mm -hmm. I think we're absolutely on the same yeah. page. Mm -hmm. Maybe I didn't make myself clear enough. Yeah, yeah. It is. I when I I mean that's exactly the point why I don't want to do t tests and just compare groups because as you say. These things are complex, but that doesn't mean that we can't say anything about them. But I do think that structural equation modeling, I also did more complex models, multi-level models and stuff. I, did, I spared you that. But in the structural equation model, if you remember, I am not saying that there is no connection or there's no relevance of the, of the cultural or the economic capital, but it is an indirect influence. It goes via this, this cognitive and this affective factor and then, and these are then as, uh, associated with English. There's no direct influence left if we control for these cognitive abilities. So I think we're on the same page. And I, but I think, I hope I'm not overestimating myself here. I think our, our analysis allows us to make actually more statements than just, oh, everything is interrelated and, and complex. We can actually um, at least formulate a new theory on, on how these things are uh, interrelated. 
Yeah, and I think a great attraction of uh, your approach is that it enables us to deconstruct the effect of SES. Otherwise, we take SES as this block, but you, you, you allow us to deconstruct it and, and then to see if in, in particular social groups, uh, you can disassociate the various components, then you might be able to move away from, for instance, you know, really scary associations with ethnicity that uh, can be misinterpreted, for instance. Yes. And, and you, you, I mean, I think that this is a brilliant point. Now, if we follow the logic of the genetic geneticists, I'm not a geneticist, I'm just absolutely, I'm, I'm actually flabbergasted. I'm in, in the process of reading their books like Robert Plomin and stuff. And as I said, as a former sociolinguist, this is, this is it's at the same time upsetting and fascinating. So Plomin would actually argue that all these things, socioeconomic status, the, the, the money that people earn, race, all these things, they disappear if we control for genetics as explanatory factors. But actually genetics explains inequalities in society. So he would, he would not say that society is unfair and that is why certain people end up uh, in certain professions. Huh? But on the other way, on the other, on the other hand, he would argue, and he does so, that actually because so much, it is the factor that explains most of the variability. But actually, the fact that people end up in different positions is an expression of social mobility. It's 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 socio sociolinguistics and social sociology upside down. It's completely crazy, and I I haven't made up my mind yet whether whether I think that it makes sense. But it is certainly extremely challenging and and, and interesting because one of the things you know is also one of the reasons why I left sociolinguistics like you know, institutionally in a way is that sociolinguistic theories are roughly still the theories from the 1980s. I mean, it's, we're still operating with the same ideas about class and society. And um, so I got interested in other stuff. I'm not saying it's all wrong, but I got interested in other stuff. Um, so, so I'm happy to send you the references to, the, I find them really, as I said, upsetting, but actually in a, in a, in a good way. I mean, it, it makes us think about stuff. But I think we yeah. agree on, on this. Yes, ethnicity, race, the fact uh, of you know whether you are a migrant or not. If we control properly for all these things, there's nothing left. Mig migration per se is not a problem. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very eye-opening. Any more questions? Do I have time for a couple quick ones? I mean, we are definitely over time, but uh, if, if uh, Raphael doesn't mind, shoot. I don't have a train okay. to catch. Um, <laughs> all right, well, first of all, thanks for a really um, interesting and inspiring talk. So I have just one quick clarification question about the modeling. So I really liked, you know, how you did started off with your exploratory factor analysis on the smaller sample, then followed it up to see how, you know, applicable these results were broadly. I was a bit curious, what's the motivation behind running a confirmatory factor analysis as a follow-up rather than doing another exploratory factor analysis and see if the factor structures match? Um, exactly what I tried to say, probably I say, said it too clumsily. Um, you, it is much more challenging uh, or much less likely that you, mm -hmm. The confirmatory factor analysis will be will be a good fit uh, because you basically pre-specify the structure. And as I said, one of the problems I see in applied linguistics is basically systematic and massive overfitting of data of models on data, mm -hmm. and also then you know small samples and complicated multiple regression analysis, and that's, oh, this is interaction. And, yeah. and then you would do exactly the same paradigm in the same context, and the model would, would, would be completely different. And that's why I do believe that actually the more rigorous approach of not saying, okay, I'm gonna explore a second time, but I'm gonna use that structure and fit it on a new, completely new data set. Mm -hmm. We did different variants, and I'm happy to share this with you. You can do this different ways. You can actually fix the estimates to, to the level that you found in the first, or you can just fix the structure. So there's different ways. We did all of them and, and we discussed it in our chapter. Um, so I think it is more rigorous. It is more, it is more likely that you will fail, that the, that the result will be no, it's not a good fit. But I think it is important to be rigorous. And also what I, 
I am not, as you probably figured out, I am not one of these uh, dynamic systems people who, who would say, oh, everything is so individual and depends on the uh, on the conditions that were um, that were valid at the at, you know at T one, but then things are are nonlinear. And so I do believe that we should at least try to see whether there's something generalizable about what we find. This is we can discuss that. I am not. Yeah, I do believe in generalization. I think it is our task to generalize. But in order to be able to generalize, in, in order to be able to also inform the policy discourse, I believe we should uh, try to get as robust uh, results as we can. And that is why we went for the, the, you know, this replication of the same logic of the study and then do the confirmatory analysis. Now, mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, you can also, I, of course, then I also did, the, I just explored the, the structure just out of curiosity to see whether something completely different comes, but it, it's the same, the same three factor solution comes out. So basically what you're saying um, makes still sense because you would actually get the same result. It's just, I think, less rigorous. No, but your point's well taken, actually, that by applying the same factor structure and testing it, that, that, that's a, that's a really like that approach. Do you have time for one more? Very quick question, a little more theoretical? I have time. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll be, I'll be quick. So um, with the language aptitude, I was something that's been kind of making me curious about this kind of reading a bit of Gnarly's work in the past and, you know, hearing yours today. Um, we keep getting this idea, this sort of idea of, is, is, do you think there's a threshold for attainment at this point, or is it just more, the aptitude we're talking about is more the trajectory is like with enough input, eventually people will arrive at a state of equilibrium that looks functionally competent, but what we're seeing here via these analyses would indicate that it just, the trajectory is different rather than the outcome. Or can your data speak to that for that matter? I'm not sure um, whether I understand your use of the threshold idea. So when you mm, say that might have been a bad way to phrase it, in yeah. all fairness. So I think you're right that what we, what we can show is how far do they get at T3 mm -hmm. when given the information that we gathered at T1. So mm -hmm. in this respect, although we could not, and I could give you the exact reasons why, we cannot calculate gain scores because we had to completely change the testing paradigm because the learners were much better than we expected. So we had to, we had, it was an emergency, emergency thing we had to change the test. Um, so we cannot make any statements about, you know, the, that many points more that they, that they get, but we know how they performed at T3. And yes, and we can put that in relation to the information that we get gathered at T1. And in this respect, we can make statements about, yeah, what is possible to attain within a given, within a given time interval. Is that an answer to your question? It, it, it does, yeah, it yeah. is. That's great, thank you. All right, thank you all for a great discussion. Um, I don't think there's any more questions uh, and we're pretty much over the time limit. We don't wanna to torture uh, our guest speaker today anymore, but thank you so much. Let's, let's thank him uh, once again. Uh, here's a little silent applause from all of us. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I'm sure we'll continue uh, collaborating with you at some level at some point um, further. Yeah. Yes. Thank and you very I, much for be bearing with me and uh, yeah, hope to see you all in person soon. It will happen sooner or later, yeah. hopefully yeah. soon. <laughs> all right. Okay. I'll see you all then at our next guest speaker lecture and we'll send you information about that soon. All right. Bye all. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.